rolling. Well, all right then. Hello there. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Bodybuilding.com podcast here in Boise, Idaho. Uh, I'm Nick, the host up in here. It's early. We're up when you're not. <laughs> uh, I've got my teeny little espresso cup here. So does Rob Phillips, I guess, yeah, over it's, here. It's mini- <laughs> right <in> the- <laughs> That's exactly right. Heather Eastman over here. Uh, you have a, the, the usual large cup of... Absolutely. I, I've got my H mug. It's like H. It's like the Easter egg in every single podcast. Is it there? there? <laughs> but Rob, Rob is our guest today. Yes, Rob, Rob with two Bs. The second B is for bodybuilding.com. Yeah, obviously. we can do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or is uh for big old quads? No, it's uh, for not being abbreviated. It's just Rob. It's, it's just Rob. Robert. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, he's a large power lifter who wears small pants sometimes. Yeah, they're pretty tight. And uh, hence the name, hence his, uh, his handle, Quads Like Rob. Um, you're a new athlete on teambodybuilding.com, but not a new athlete in general. You've been, you've been doing stuff for a really long time. seems like you're a wrestler, you were yeah. an MMA fighter, you were a judo champion, now pretty firmly in powerlifting. Or are you pretty firmly in powerlifting? No, I'm still pretty <laughs> firmly in powerlifting. I'll probably re- retire back to the mixed martial arts or something, you know, really? something in that area. Or, okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Um, I mean, but when we say he's pretty firmly in powerlifting, he's got some some pretty incredible lifts out there. Um, totaled well over 2,000 in competition. Uh, squatted 959 pounds, benched well over 500, and deadlifted 770. One. Ah, see, he knows the numbers. <laughs> so thanks for talking with us, Rob. A pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, very interestingly, you also squatted 800, uh, 800 and change last week in the cage at yep. the Arnold with a torn hamstring. How? Tell me how that went down. Went, well, uh, you know, just training, you never know. You know, you get to a certain weight, you know, you mm-hmm. never know how the training's going to go. Um, anything could pop any time, you know, warm-up could be off. You could just be a little bit fatigued or not recover from the previous workout. Mm-hmm. And I had a little pop, you know, I felt something and a couple of days later bled out. So, uh, two weeks later I was supposed to squat in the cage. I was supposed to actually squat a grand. So, oh, really? Uh, was it, was this your first time in the cage or? Well, that was my fourth year in the cage. I, th- I thought so. I thought you'd been there before. Yeah. Yeah. So my first year, I'll just give you a recap. My first year I uh, squatted 905 naked knee, which is mm-hmm. the belt. So, mm-hmm. In powerlifting, usually somebody wears, you'll wear sleeves, you'll right. wear wraps, you'll wear something on your knees. Especially up around 900 pounds. That's pretty yeah. rare, yeah. Yeah, so my second year, I put on wraps to see if I could do something a little bit more exciting. I doubled 900 my second year, and my third year, I doubled 925. Mm-hmm. See, and that, that's one thing I like about the cage is it's not just like, all right, what's one weight you can handle one time? You see people saying, all right, how many reps can I do with an right. incredible mm-hmm. weight? It's beautiful to watch, yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I was also going to demo a new bar. So I wanted to put on something that would kind of make a wave or at least be interesting to look at. Mm-hmm. Call the grand, end up not being able to do that. I notified Animal about a week out saying, you know, hey, it's not recovering. I'm, I'm not 100%. I wouldn't be able to push it. I, I really don't want to take up that spot or put a, you know, a gap in your production, right? Mm-hmm. Make sure you guys have a good showing. And, you t- and Eric Schwartz, you know, talked me through it and said, like, hey, you really just want to see how you feel. Maybe just show up and warm up. See how it goes. Mm-hmm. Which, in case you've never been to the animal cage, it's kind of hard to shut down. <laughs> to just warm up. <laughs> to warm up and not go 100%, right? Right. In any kind of competitor, even yourself, said you kind of had an evolution of, of competing, right? Mm-hmm. From one thing to another. So it's very hard to, you know, call it quits. Yeah. So, just, what, so what did so. you do? How did, I mean, you know, a, a torn hamstring is uh, not only a, a painful injury it's it's also one that really fun fundamentally alters your mechanics potentially mm-hmm. like how did, how did you how did yeah you so it alters your mechanics it? uh when i when i did pop it or you know get, feel that strain i was a little bit wider than normal uh, mm-hmm. you know i'm a fairly narrow squatter uh, a lot of times you see a big squatter they're gonna be a wide stance they're gonna take up as much of the posterior chain as they can you know limit that range of motion right uh, hypothetically you know in the movement and get the most weight on their back i've always been a fairly quad dominant narrow stance squatter um, so I just exaggerated that. I, I narrowed my stance some more. I drove my knees a little bit over the toes, probably almost almost out of position, so I could take the load off my hamstrings and glutes. Hmm. And did did it, I, well? You got up so, to eight hundred, and it felt good. Felt good enough that I would I would have went nine, but one of those things, mm-hmm. insurance policy, there is none there, so mm-hmm. <laughs> it really wasn't worth it. It's not documenting anything. It's just for fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's exhibition, so. Uh, I called it there, which was the hardest thing I've done in a while. So. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, especially because I mean that's uh, you know you have your choice when you're preparing for a powerlifting meet. Like, am I am I the sort of person who's going to really hype myself up, or am I the sort of person who's going to really calm myself down before I lift? I'm sure. Yeah, you've I seen think both you have kinds. both. You know, sides of the spectrum there on the lifters. You see real high intensity guys that got to 
you know, get really amped up, whether it's anger or emotion of some sort, and they, they visually looked amped up, or you have guys that are fairly calm and, and mellow. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm definitely on the, the calmer side. Mm-hmm. But in, in the in the cage with animal, it's not there's not a calm and mellow yeah, place. It, you don't have that option. <laughs> no, I, I would. <laughs> I've always said like I feel like I, I'm just in a gym when I'm there. Mm-hmm. But there's definitely energy all around you, right? You you hear it, you feel it. You know, you can't look in any direction without somebody looking at you and saying, you know, cheering you on or trying mm-hmm. to talk to you and and ask you what you're going for, how you feel, and etc. Sure. What's it, some of the cool stuff you saw there this year? Uh, you know, the probably I didn't get to see it firsthand because I got there a day late, but uh, uh, there was a 900 pound pull, and then he turned around. Uh, Chris Weiss, I think his name, I might be pronoun- mispronouncing that, but mm-hmm. he's a 23 year old kid out of the Midwest, and so he pulled 900 pounds. 23, wow. Mm-hmm. Pulled 900 pounds, and then he did something that was just kind of ludicrous. He uh, he paused 900 pounds at the knee. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. So like somebody would usually do that with about 60% of right, the Right, exactly. Uh-huh. And he did with a, well, not a hundred percent. I think he's pulled like nine, 930 before. This is, this is an oh. intentional pause. It's not like, oh my oh, God, nope. it's not coming. This, <laughs> one, this is an intentional one count, uh-huh. almost a two count at the knee and then finishes wow. the deadlift. See, hey, wh- where impressive. where else in the world except in a place like that or, or is that uh, is that a sexy thing? It's like, hey, he paused it. Look at he paused it, you know? It Until takes you, re- a bunch of real lifters to yeah. well, on top of that, on I'm that. not a deadlifter. You know, 771, 922, or 959. Right. So mm-hmm. I've always kind of respected something that you're not good at, you know, kind of an area to improve or maybe something that you'll never be able to achieve, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. a deadlift is um, – if you've ever tried pausing anything, right. any kind of movement, it's harder. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dramatically, mm-hmm. exponentially even, so – yeah. Dang, so so now so so before you were uh, a powerlifter, you were a fighter. Which one was your? But but I, when I when I look at your old powerlifting totals, you came into the sport lifting pretty heavy. So which oh, yeah. which was which was your first love? Were you a fighter first? I uh, you know I think uh, wrestling was my first sport that I really like fell in love with. I played football before that. I played football through high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, wrestled collegiate. Um, you know, there's something to be said about going to where you think you can go, like the mind, and then taking your body past that point. Mm-hmm. And the wrestling does that almost every practice, definitely every tournament or every hard match. You know, so that's probably where the drive and the the, the ability to push yourself to those numbers, I think, right. comes from. Mm-hmm. Now, you said that you're really calm as a lifter. Did you have that calm mindset going into a wrestling meet or were you kind of more amping yourself up? Externally, I definitely did. I was definitely calm. Internally, I was, I, I always had, a, you know, who doesn't have a lot of intensity or um, things going on in their head. Right. Kind of similar approaches to the two sports. Absolutely. Okay. And then I um, I saw on Instagram kind of a, a throwback picture of you back in the wrestling days. And, and it's very common for wrestlers, you know, you're trying to make weight. So you're like trying to be right at the top edge of your weight class. And it's just this constant dieting down and losing strength. So at what point did you kind of shift and go full board into powerlifting, you know, putting pounds not only on the bar, but on your frame? So I... I I've never had a problem putting weight on my frame. So anytime I was light or thinner or um, or leaner, whatever you want to call it, I was in starvation mode. Mm-hmm. I was 240 as a freshman in high school at 5'8". Oh, <laughs> that's a big freshman. So I wrestled 215s in high school as a Florida State champ uh-huh. wrestling as a junior. And they were terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've always felt like I was on the smaller side of the weight class. Uh-huh. A lot of big guys, you know, strong guys back then. But then I would come out on top and, and win. So I think I was 152 and 18 as a, as a high school wrestler. Hmm. Wow. Like 99 mm-hmm. pins. Uh, so I, I was in a small school. I was able to start my freshman year. So I got more matches than some um, small program. We barely filled a lineup. Mm-hmm. You know, hmm. I was the second state champ for the for the school. Mm-hmm. And and after that, I mean, that's that, for most people, that's where they're that's where their career ends is with high school, maybe a little bit of college. No, I wasn't that really that satisfied with it. Cause I, I mm-hmm. took state as a junior and then it didn't do anything my senior year. So uh, I was just going to go to USF. And then last minute a coach called me and said, Hey, you want to come wrestle? I was like, you know, whatever. Yeah. We'll go see what's going on. And went out to Missouri sight unseen and wrestled for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I guess everyone's different. I never really, th- really thought that was like a peak or a highlight. It was just something you did for like entertainment or fun. Right. right? Cause of the challenge. I, I guess I did, deeply enjoy a challenge mm-hmm. no and and I, ha- I have two young sons now and I, I think i'm starting to see that mindset more and more because i grew up with just sisters but watching boys wrestle it's just like it's, it's just something you do right you know <laughs> it's not it's not something you even think about doing you just Absolutely. do it yeah oh so so how did you get from there into mixed martial arts which is really it's a different it's a different uh so- expression of that Oh, absolutely. Grappling, I mean, it has a good foundation or base would be wrestling for any kind of grappling or martial art, I, mm-hmm. I believe, especially striking, fighting, or submission grappling. So 
uh, after wrestling, though, unless you're like extremely high level and you can pursue something, maybe an Olympic career, uh, there's not a whole lot for you. Right. Monetary, competition wise, you don't see a lot of adult wrestling. There is adult wrestling out there. It's just going to be few and far between unless you're just high level, mm -hmm. right? Like the senior open or something like that, or some open tournaments. There's there's open tournaments out there. And it's but at that point, it's I mean something people are doing as a as an activity outside of their job. It's yeah, not, it's so not pursuing. You, you know. know, once I stopped wrestling, I didn't really have a lot of interest in continuing my education, and I also uh, my girlfriend at the time got pregnant. You know, so a few life choices were made for me then. Mm -hmm. um, I started working. You know, after that, I would kind of miss that competitive nature, or spirit, whatever you want to call it, and started picking up martial arts. You know, but through that whole time, I always went to the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, I always squatted. I always, that was kind of like my pill for lack of a better term or stress relief or like kind of my time, my quiet time mm -hmm. would it be to go to the gym and train, right? Get a good sweat in, whatever. Mm -hmm. that, I did that for several years where I just kind of started my career and worked. Mm -hmm. um, but I trained the whole time. Had a good record as a, as a fighter. I did. Uh, eight and one. Um, again, that kind of died on its own, you know, kind of by life and it, uh, just, um, circumstance so i'm blind in my right eye or legally blind in my right eye so i couldn't fight as professional mm. and towards the end it was kind of hard to find amateur fights without thorough eye exams mm -hmm. you know okay. I, I would have went pro you have to be 2060 without correction before you can go pro mm -hmm. uh, in most um sanctioned bodies or athletic commissions mm -hmm. but you still wanted to compete i mean it, 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 it seems like yeah, because yeah. when i when i, when I look at powerlifting uh the open powerlifting site your uh, your competition totals start showing up not long after your last fights, it seems like. No, I think I might have fought like one last time. Some guy called me out and wanted a rematch, and I was like, oh, whatever, you know, <laughs> good, good, good yeah. idea to take a break and get in shape, and I made weight for that fight, and then after that, I kind of just let myself put on natural weight again. Mm -hmm. And how, how did that feel after, you know, a decade probably or more of like, I, I got to be controlled in my weight, that just be like, finally, I can do this. You know, you know. <laughs> I, I had already kind of gained some weight before that, so I had to lose some weight. The, my last fight, I was pretty heavy, um, heavier than I'd ever fought. Before, well, I shouldn't say my last fight. My fight before that, I had a, my, my only loss was a pretty gnarly loss. I broke my foot, my jaw, and my orbital in one fight. <laughs> so, like, big guys like and wrestlers. Like, I didn't learn striking first, and a lot of striking is head movement and kind of deceiving or, like, kind of diminishing power. And so how you diminish your slip of punch, you actually go towards power. Well, I just didn't have that natural head movement. Mm -hmm. Like, wrestlers get beat up and, like, they head, but there's a lot of pressure. But a lot of that pressure for me learning, because I only learned as a high school wrestler. I didn't grow up wrestling. I didn't have good movement, but I was real good with power and pressure mm -hmm. and forward progression. Like you go towards power, you deliver more power, right? You kind of that's, that's right? the football player in you. Yeah, that definitely, right? I mean, that's definitely lineman, mm -hmm. running back, or uh, go linebacker. Through something, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you're going to deliver the the hit to them. You're not going to take the hit. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, when you get 260 pounds and 260 pounds, and they start throwing blows at each other, those heads and bodies don't move easily, so things break. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Wow. Now there are plenty of tough lifters. There are plenty of strong fighters, but you don't you don't always see those two go hand in hand. How did you find they fed off of each other? Or, I mean, did, did, did you feel like they really helped each other out at all? I think, you know, strength's going to be a, a a good thing for anything you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, even for me, like work environment, once you conquer something or learn something thoroughly to where you're like an expert in your own like realm of just lifting, I think you're going to be more confident and more more apt to succeed in what you're the task at hand. Oh, sure. I mean, and it's easy, it's easy to imagine like, Hey, you don't want to get hit by a guy who can bench 500 pounds, right. but it's not, it's not as, as straightforward as that either. Right. I mean, cause they're no. so different. It's so unilateral. It's so bench rotational. It has nothing to do with the strike. The strike comes from the hips, in my opinion, or a thrill comes from the hips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that you learn that in wrestling or, or in technique form, or maybe you just have it. You know, I couldn't throw a football 50 yards, but I could dump anyone on their head. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. So... Do you do you miss fighting? Absolutely. Yeah. How, how do you how do you get your fix for that? Uh, I guess the the sets that I think I, I in my mind I'm not sure if I could hit them. Mm -hmm. So those max you know, platform mm -hmm. competing, I guess. Um, that and just the you have some days where you challenge yourself in the gym that might not be max, max weight, but you can still challenge yourself in other ways. Right. I had five hours sleep, but I still had a two hour session that was was good, or maybe it was a rep PR, or maybe it was just a solid training session looking through you seem to be just squats or your comfort zone and you mentioned that you're not great at deadlift and i caught that number different discrepancy there where it's like wait a second he's 200 pounds lighter on his sure. deadlift that's not normal now um in other interviews they've kind of tried to pin you down on like well what, what else do you do besides squat and your answer seems to be no i i squat i squat <laughs> i squat so if you did have to kind of 
go into the gym and you're doing, you know, like, let's say you're working around that injury in your hamstring, like what are some other lifts that you really kind of feel fit your wheelhouse and fit your style? Oh, I love pressing, you know, I'm right. not, I never thought I'd bench 500 pounds and I did pretty quickly. I think in my first year of powerlifting. Um, so I, I love just training, mm-hmm. you know, I, I really, I train all athletes or in my experience, all like athletes kind of start somewhere in that bodybuilding realm. You know, whether we like it or not, whether we looked up to Ronnie Coleman, you right. know, Tom Platz or Jay Cutler, whatever, however old you are, right? Or even like a Lee Priest or something. Or you read, Hulk read Hogan amazing. or whoever, right? Hulk Hogan. <laughs> or, I, I liked um, uh, Sting better, but whatever, you know, right. <laughs> you know, I didn't really care for wrestling. It was kind of <laughs> dramatic for me, but we all watched it growing up, right? So whatever magazine you read, you know, we, I, I trained or I overtrained as a bodybuilder in high school, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like right. as much as I could. And do you still sneak some of those bodybuilding lifts in? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Doesn't and even it, seem like you sneak them. Like you yeah. own them. Seems, you put them on Instagram. Like, hey, I'm going to do some lateral raises yeah, here. Yeah, you're sitting there doing <laughs> lateral raises and daring anybody else to call you out on it. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I, I love those movements. Mm-hmm. You know, who doesn't like big shoulders? Right. right. Or width. You know, I've never had a wide back and I finally do. You know, I'm going to make sure I keep it. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's health training at a certain point too. Like everybody needs that, that broad muscular foundation. Not to right? get too like metaphorical or like anxious or whatever you want to call it, but we, our bodies were meant to move, right? Mm-hmm. We weren't meant to sit all day. You know, we were meant to sweat. You know, even the sauna has all these studies out there about how much it could, could extend your life, right? Hey, That's you don't simply, have to tell me about that, man. I'm telling everybody around the sauna every single day around you here. Yeah, I cut it out a long time ago uh-huh. um, because it takes such a toll on you. If you're trying to cut weight and perform, I would never use a sauna to cut mm-hmm. weight. But here recently, I read some stuff and I started, you know, I couldn't squat as much as I wanted to like the last few weeks. And I was like, I'm just going to add sauna sessions. Mm-hmm. You know, it helped. It helped quite a bit. You know, I felt better. I slept better. So um, there's proof in the pudding, right? Yeah, well, I think so. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think you you hit on something good there because a lot of people embrace things like the sauna and also hot yoga. They think, oh, it's going to help me lose weight. That's not what it's for, really. Mm -hmm. It's giving you all the other benefits of cardio, all the circulation, Mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's cardio without actually having to do the cardio. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Oh, for recovery. Man, I, f- I find that I can recover so much better when I sit in the sauna four or five times a week. It's the best. Right. All right. See, well, this and, guy, he gets it. And since you <laughs> kind of took it there, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading through and reading some of your quotes. And you've quoted everyone from like Freud to Fight Club. And, uh, <laughs> and I have. A lot, and a lot, of your, a lot of your kind of mentality seems to be about um, both escaping, like not being controlled by your ego, but also not being controlled by society's rules. And I'm just kind of curious, like how you developed your particular mentality in terms of how you approach competition. I feel like I need to prep for this conversation. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I know, this is deep. (laughs) This is going to go way back. So I really idolized my brother and uh, he was a Marine. He was in Desert Storm. And, you know, the whole like saying that doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? And there's a lot of like things they do to military people to make sure that they think they're invincible or make sure they can handle stressful situations. I'd probably say it goes back to him. And then the older I got, the more I realized like what you think will be, you know, all these other aspects of life. And then recently the Freud, <laughs> I, I read the road less travel and I was like obsessed, like doing research on him. It's a it classic. Was, mm-hmm. It was just awesome. You know, and then, uh, you know, Jordan Peters popularity re- recently, you know, so there's a lot of things there, but the fight club and the relationship of control. So like, I've always said like the only way to control something I just posted this the other day, the only way to truly control something. And sometimes you have to really total control. So my analogy to that would be getting on a plane. So like the first time I flew, I was like 16. I flew alone. I went to Boston and it was, it was hor- horrible, right? Horrifying. You know, I've since then had to send my 14 year old on a plane. I try and talk him through it. Right. And like, how do I, really assess this. And I, like once you accept that in the event that you did, your fate was not to land, right? To crash. You know, and this is crazy. Like planes don't crash that often, right? Statistically. Well, once you accept that, then you actually regain control, right? Of the situation. And then you can relax and control your destiny. Hmm. So relinquishing that control to the pilot, the crew, whatever, the airline, then you can be in control of yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's really what you will, the only thing you can truly really control in life. See, but now that that makes sense when you're on an airplane, but when you're squatting with 900 pounds on your back, it seems like it'd be harder to make that that leap sometimes. I don't know. You tell me. It's not at all. Mm -hmm. If you commit to something, then you're committing to it. There's no question. Just let go. mm -hmm. I always, when I teach squatting, I don't know why people (laughs) get so (laughs) bent out of shape about having the weight on them. Right. 
Um, usually I would, um, but either way, when I teach squatting, you know, I, I try and preach and, and communicate that if we commit to anything that we do, whether I'm going to write a paper or whether I'm going to squat something to depth, I'm going to put a new max on my back. If we committed to it, then we have nothing to walk away with shame or disappointment or guilt or any of those things because we give everything. And that's a really hard thing to do if you've never done it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. But Every t- chance you get that you try harder to commit to it completely, knowing you gave everything, like even for me, that's hard to do. I'm not going to lie. But when you do that, you can you can actually possibly succeed or at least eliminate all the obstacles that would prevent you from succeeding. Hmm. So is that how you went from a 766 squat to a 960 pound squat? Is that is that all it is? It's just that that shift? No, that was following a program. I had never followed a program until I power lifted. You could so you're squatting 760 without ever having followed a program. I ran two cycles of Brandon Lilly's like cookie cutter program, sure. mm-hmm. which essentially made me train less, is what it mm-hmm. did. Because every third week you push a lift hard, it was called a Q method. It was actually very simple, rudimentary, but it worked right and it kept you lifting fresh, right? So I was a five day a week guy, six day or whatever I wanted. If I felt good that day, I was going to go push the bar, you know, I'd bench three times a week, whatever. Well, that made me detrain some and able to push the lifts and kind of make the lifts count when I did them, which I had done in other aspects like wrestling or competing or fighting where you take rest periods of up to a week. So you're fresh and you have nothing hurting. And it makes sense, right? You go in there, you can, right. you have no fear in the back of your head. All oh, this, this knee bothers me or this wrist hurts. You know, you go out there, you give it your all. And again, you have no obstacles preventing you from winning, mm-hmm. right? Performing. Um, same token, being able to do that from a lifting standpoint and actually resting more was able to push my lifting days that mattered heavier. So then I was fresh every time I lifted big. Mm-hmm. Were you somebody in the past who was uh, guilty of chasing a heavy single too often, you think? No, I, I hate the ego. Mm-hmm. I'm not a very ego-driven person. Um, you know, I, I, anytime you go in the gym for ego, I mean, obviously I would, I would get to like that 45 minute, hour and a half mark and I would start feeling really good and start pushing weights. But I wasn't doing those on main lifts, you know. I I, I did the main lifts just to challenge myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I wasn't looking around as he was watching. I was in the corner with my headphones on with nobody there, you know, by myself. Um, yeah. Every time you I always I always say, leave the way you go out the door and you'll be better for it, right? Mm-hmm. Just be honest with yourself. Look yourself in the mirror. Did I really do good today? I really hit death. I think that's the only thing that really made me different and stand out when I first started. So I was already squatting six seventy five for a triple to a twelve inch box. And I was doing that with a bodybuilding buddy. Mm-hmm. You know, but I just made sure I did it to box, so I made sure I hit depth, so I didn't have any question. I wasn't filming it at that point, you know, but I knew that I touched the box. I knew I was at depth. Mm-hmm. You know, so doing that did two things. It made me squat to depth, whether I had a box or not, and it also made me control my descent, which increased the load and time under tension sure. on the descent, which breaks down more muscle. Hmm. Well, I didn't know that then, but hindsight, that made my quads and squat bigger, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So I didn't deadlift until that first time I ran that program, too. So oh, really? 31 was the first time I You were just lifted. squatting and that was it. <laughs> I was just squatting just and pu- squatting. pushing. Yep. Mm-hmm. I, in high school, we did, uh, I, I weight lifted, but it was clean and jerk and bench. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so clean and jerk and bench doesn't have anything. I mean, it's explosive movements, they're fast movements, but they don't have anything to do with deadlift form. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't know how to lock in my back. I mean, I, no, I really didn't. I didn't know how to deadlift until I was much later in life. Mm. So now, one, one one thing that I like about um, what I've seen of your your posts on social media is you don't just you don't just post the PRs. You post a lot of not even rep PRs, but just reps. And and you do high rep work. You know, you go on his Instagram, you can see you sitting on the back with your feet in the air doing dumbbell bench presses for high reps. And I was wondering, you know, what um, what do high reps do for you as a strength athlete, and how do you use high reps to build strength? So there should be a, a whole lot of high reps. On there, but there is, you know, it might seem high because it's sets of 10 or I do AMRAPs every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, But just real quick to cover like my posts, like um, I've always just posted that that started as a training log. Mm -hmm. I I tried to keep it true to just a training log. And a lot of people, like I used to get feedback all the time. I was like, oh, I love how you didn't sell out. You just post your training. Right. And, you know, and now I post more life stuff too in there. But, you know, I kind of kept it as simply my training log. And a lot of people like (laughs) Even my ex-wife once says, like, why do you post so much? I was like, mm-hmm. that's just my trail. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't really think about it. I just post my my facts. If they want to look at it, they can. If they don't, they can scroll on. You know, um, back to the high reps. Air reps are just a good a good way of pushing yourself. So if you hit, like, a heavy double, triple, whatever on a movement, I think you want to drop by, like, 10, 15, 20, 30% and do an air rep, it could be a good gauge of, of progress. Mm-hmm. Is what I use it for. Okay. Okay. So just, yeah, another way of. And right now, like I, I also work with a coach and I, uh, who's Josh Bryant, and I haven't before that. I, Josh is great. Josh yeah. is a phenomenal guy, right? 
he's he's done it. He's got a lot of knowledge and actual education to back it up now. And he's done the thing. So I've always been, you know, I always respected somebody that's been there and done it. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't always make the best coaches, but a lot of times they, they, you get them talking, you can learn things from them and their own experiences. Right. Mm -hmm. Any expert. And he's a great talker. Any (laughs) SME, right. Any subject matter expert can, once you get them opened up, whether they are a good coach or not, they can still, you can still learn from them. Actually, you can learn from anyone talk to, but you can still learn something from them. Mm -hmm. So he, he covers both sides. He's smart. He's done it, and he continues to learn. Sure, yeah, he's he's been a long time contributor to bodybuilding.com. Yeah, pretty, talk, pretty much every other public. I talked to him this, you know? this morning a little bit. He's like, "Yeah, I've written like forty articles." I was like, "I mean, that's awesome." He's like, "They're great people. They're mm-hmm. cool cats." Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to have him on the podcast at some point too because he's he's an interesting guy. He has a lot of historical knowledge about strength about sports. strength sports. Like he's a he's a real scholar in his own a historian. way. Historian, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, he's a guy who. He works with bodybuilders, he works with powerlifters, and he kind of seems to get that it's all part of the same expression. It's not like these are just different teams They're or not different individual sports. silos working in, you know, yeah, by there's, themselves. There's right? a lot of crossover for sure. And I mean, you you yourself said that, you know, you were basically working out with a bodybuilder and working out as a bodybuilder when you were right. squatting 600 pounds initially. So Absolutely, yeah. Hmm. So I, I wanted to ask you just a, a little bit more. You, you alluded to a little bit about, about the mental space that you kind of get into for you know, a really big lift for, um, you know, say you're going to squat 900 pounds, something like that. I wanted you to walk us, th- walk us through what, what that's like, because it's easy for us to imagine like, okay, you have 10 minutes until you're going to get into the bar. You know, that's, that's going to happen. And somebody would be sitting there. Maybe they're nervous. Maybe they're just trying to calm themselves down. Maybe they're trying to amp themselves up. What does that 10 minutes look like for you? What do you, what are you doing? What's your so, ritual? I guess. Yeah, my, well, the, I'm glad you said ritual. So I'm, you know, any personality out there, they, they people will argue mm-hmm. that they're either AD, ADD or they're OCD. And like with a ritual or routine with lifting, you need to make sure that you duplicate the process, right? If it's repetitive and, you know, you do it well enough every time you train, then you'll be able to do it under high stress situations without actually thinking. So like, not to like digress so much, but back to wrestling real quick. Mm-hmm. My dad the other day at the Arnold, like his second time he ever came to watch me lift, just, I don't know why it's that way, but he's never really seen me compete or lift. Well, he made it out and he watched me. Well, we were at dinner, my, my kids and my girlfriend, and, and we were just joking around and just talking, carrying on, whatever. And he started telling a story about how I wrestled. I used to wrestle one time. I don't remember this story, but it brings a bell that he said it. You know, I'd come off the mat angry and disappointed, and I won. Mm-hmm. And he'd try and talk to me and ask, you know, what are you talking about? I said, he did great. It was phenomenal. You know, he didn't have a chance or you outscored him, whatever you pinned him. I was like, I had to think twice about what I did. So in wrestling, if you have to think, and back then I, I knew it, and, and now in lifting, if you think during anything that you do, you're going to be slower and you're not going to execute. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it needs to be something that's engraved to you to the 1,000, 2,000 t- you know, rep range where you it's instinctual. Mm-hmm. So every time I touch the bar, my routine is going to be within like 90% the same thing. Whether it's 135 or 330 or 315, three plates or 900, my ritual looks the same. Mm-hmm. When you mentioned your brother as inspiration for kind of that mentality, and that's a very military approach where you've just drilled it so many times that mm-hmm. you don't have to think when, mm-hmm. when something triggers, you just go and you do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like a very similar kind of mentality of just do it, do it, do it, and to the point where you don't even have to think. It right. Just so happens. if you're thinking you're going you're gonna to execute slower, you're going to introduce self doubt, you're going to build the anxiety and stress. And, and when it comes to strength, like you don't have time for that. Mm-hmm. You really can't think at all. So to answer your question, I look the same as I would in the gym, and I'm going to be very calm, and anybody could walk up to me and talk to me. Mm-hmm. So you're not sitting there, headphones on, or or do you do you find well, a, do you find I a do, quiet I wear, space? I, I wear headphones, and I, I kind of want to get – I did you wear them for a long time, and I want to kind of get away from them again because mm-hmm. I don't use them to warm up in the warm-up room, and I don't use them to compete. You know, and the same with, like, everything should be mimicked. Like, I don't look in a mirror when I compete. You know, so I try and d- duplicate that uh, – the way you compete, practice how you compete, right? Practice how you play, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm not going to be looking in the mirror. I'll be looking out into open space or open gym or, or into a crowd, whatever. And you're not going to have headphones on, right? You're not, you're not going to be able to get that amped up every, or I'm not the, able to get to that amped right. up state. Maybe I could, I lack intensity at some time, at some point, you know, or I appear to, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Externally, but no, I'm going to be calm docile. Mm-hmm. So is that why you have the nickname Buddha? No, that's actually funny. That's Rudy. So Rudy's my oldest brother. He's who I, I idolize, you know, because he was kind of gone. He's much older than me. And I only spent, I lived with him in high school quite a bit. Um, 
but yes, <laughs> when I was a football player in high school, I, I think I played a couple of games. I played the season of JV and then I, I bumped up to varsity my freshman year, 5'8", 240. Right, that's, mm-hmm. that's a pretty short stature for 240. <laughs> I have Buddha belly, so okay. So it's a that, it's a physical <laughs> comparison. It was a physical nickname, yeah. Okay, it, but it's it's fitting in its own way, it, though. It, mm-hmm. Very much so. And, he, and he's he's um he has a philosophy degree, and he's definitely a thinker. Mm-hmm. You know, so I get a lot of that from him. Hmm. Right, he'd always always ask why, or or I'd say something like, uh, "Oh, I I really lucked out with my kids." And he's like, "What are you talking about? That's ridiculous." Like your kids are that way because you're the, your father. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> he, he always okay. will like straighten you right out. Yeah. Well, and, and you mentioned that your post, posts have become more and more about your life. And, you know, I noticed a lot of family and we've mentioned your family several times. And one post really stuck out to me. You talked about saying that, you know, lifting, like having kids lift is as asinine as saying the earth is flat, like, or not, or, having, kids or not having kids lift, like mm-hmm. that it's going to hurt them. And, you know, we, we kind of, encounter that a lot with people are constantly asking, like, how, you know, how can I get my kid lifting? And right now the prevailing wisdom in the medical community is no, don't lift. It's going to hurt them. So tell me a little bit about kind of your approach with that. Cause both your kids are, they're very athletic. They're athletic they're, and, you know, they're and wrestlers. As my daughter and, shows any interest, we're going to have her lifting. She's squatted with a dowel or a broom, broomstick before or a PVC pipe, but she hasn't touched any weight yet. Cause she's just not interested. I don't want to push her too hard. She's a wrestler though. Yep. She's Roger. She's super strong. She's got my legs. She's got nice, solid legs. <laughs> I mean, she's going to be able to do what she wants when she's. She literally has quads doing. like Rob. She really does. <laughs> she's got really solid knees. Um, she's built. You know, she's going to mm-hmm. be a solid little girl, or she already is. Um, so, back to your question. So, statistically, like if you do any research, I think Starting Strength and, and Mark Ripto posted in his book that statistically you're more likely to go get her on a soccer field. And ironically, I coached my son never playing soccer. I coached him when he was like five years old, I think, or itty bitty, just like way too little, maybe six, whatever the case may be. I coached I'm like these kids, you can't even get them to run the same direction, right? <laughs> right? And they're like, they're coached. running into each other and yeah. then they're it's trying to kick ball. a ball. Right. Well, statistically, there's more injuries. Obviously, per capita, there's going to be more players, right? But there's more injuries playing soccer than there is doing a two-dimensional movement mm-hmm. of a lift. So if they're under good supervision, and maybe you can t- teach them how to brace, or maybe you just don't push weight initially until they get the form down, which is logical, right? The logical thing to do and make sure they're doing it correctly. Yeah. They have the movement down. Um, I, I just think um, back to the doctors, right? Say, no. Well, if I go talk to a doctor about what I do, so I've had a couple injuries and had things repaired, and they're like, no, what, you're doing what? You know? <laughs> You know, at 13 weeks, I, I deadlifted after tearing my bicep. And he, and he was like, I can't just believe that, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So doctors are, whether they're groomed by maybe the, the texts or the instruction, the teaching, whatever, isn't there. But I think some of it is also driven by our society and just like the liability side of it. Right. right? Well, Obviously, that's going to be some of, of that yeah. issue. The yeah, lesson it's... is find a doctor who lifts. Well, it's a... It's a... <laughs> find a doctor who lifts, but a lot of times they still don't lift heavy. They do it right. for a health benefit. Right, um, right. There's very few and far between. I had a chiropractor that did lift, and he was phenomenal. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he could he could adjust me, and nobody could. But he was my size, you know? Um, yeah, so find a doctor that lifts. Find one that's open-minded or that actually cares to listen and understand what, what you do mm-hmm. um, or has experience in it. Yeah, I mean, for sure, like, you could cause damage to the ephesial plates before they're done growing if you were lifting super, super heavy. But just the notion that kids can't lift or can't be active. And to your point, we were talking about this the other day, that, you know, female soccer players are the highest percentage of knee injuries just because the nature of the sport and the way that they're growing at that time, it's like this perfect combination of Horrible. Cutting and turning. You and know? it's, I mean, and it's kind of sad once once you become somebody who really enjoys lifting to feel like it's not something that you can share with your kids too. Because right. I have my little garage gym set up. My three year old and my seven year old, man, they want in. They want in. Like there's so <laughs> many things to touch. Exactly. <laughs> it's, pick up. it's a playground. Yeah. And it's they a, roll. You know. Oh, yeah, I, okay. I don't. I don't want to tell them no. It just, and they they can set appropriate yeah. limits for these sorts of things. Yeah, I know. train out of a CrossFit box. They bring their kids and they're hanging off the the yeah. bars and they're just. I mean, and they've got that crazy kid strength, you know, where they can do anything. So yeah, the yeah. power weight ratio. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now I, I was I was curious about how how. Um, how much you train now? Because you mentioned like, okay, when you were following the cube method, you slimmed it down quite a bit, the actual training that you yeah, were Yeah, I think doing. that might have been three days with like one accessory day. I'm mm-hmm. still on the four day, five day mark. Mm-hmm. I think my planning is four days. If I if I work too long, if I have like a 13, four hour, 14 hour day, maybe I have to cut it into two. But most of the time I'll try and bang it out in, in one session. It's just sometimes I stretch like two, three hours 
or three and a half hours at the gym, it's a bit much, right? Mm -hmm. But four days is pretty standard right now. Okay. And are you, you're preparing for another competition? Yeah. So the next competition I should do, as long as everything stays healthy, it would be Boss of Bosses. Mm -hmm. Which is classic. August. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Right. I've mm -hmm. supported them. I, I think the only one I've missed was the first and the, and the fifth. So I've done it three times, but I've been to all of them, but the first. Mm hmm you know, to mm -hmm. support Dan and Sparkle. They're good people. And sure. it's a fun meet. And, um, you know, they try and do make a production of it. And it's, it's good for the sport. Sure. And how much, how much more, or what, what goals competitively or in the gym do you feel like you're like, I still got to do this? You know, I haven't told, I haven't totaled 2200 raw in sleeves. Mm -hmm. So I'm really known as a, a sleeve squatter or a bare knee squatter more than my wrap. A lot of times wraps will give you about a hundred pounds and I get like virtually 30, 40 pounds out of them if that. Um, so I would like to total 2200 raw in sleeves and I, I really want to improve my record, you know. Uh, at some one point, you know, this hammy is a little frustrating, but at one point I want to try and be the lightest guy to squat a thousand. Mm -hmm. You know, I think like that'd that would be kind of cool. You yeah. Know? Seems like the sort of thing that would work well at the Arnold. Also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it wouldn't count. So I'd have to do right. it on a platform. But yes, it, it would have been a good run, had a right good practice. You know, I would like to do that around 300 pounds or even lighter. You know, there's a lot of guys out there that are in the nines or not a lot. There's a couple guys out there in the nines that are really good. Uh, Dennis Cornelius is one of them. He's a good guy. And, you know, we competed together before and he squats in the nines, but to squat like a grand in sleeves would just be insane. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking with us, Rob. Thank you. Uh, how, do, how do people find you out there? Uh, you know, they can reach me on Instagram. It's probably the best. I, I've got a YouTube channel, but it's, it's small right now. So hopefully now I'll start growing that and mm -hmm. putting that more content out there on YouTube. Yeah, I, he's out there on Instagram wearing the BBCom swole shirt. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am. And, and Google, you know, my name's so unique. Uh, Philippus, there's a, there's only one Rob Philippus out there. Mm -hmm. yeah, but what you'll find is a lot of your old fights, too. I know. Yes. Yeah, you will. <laughs> well, it's like Rob happens. If you just search Rob, it'll probably come up, too. Great. Rob Philippus, thank you so much for talking to us, buddy. Yeah. Thank you.